You've decided you're ready to become a parent, and suddenly you're overwhelmed with people who feel they have the right to inform you on the correct way to conceive, give birth, what fears you should have, and the proper way to parent. How do you filter through the opinions? How do you know what's trustworthy information and what's a myth or just plain outdated? Welcome to the Birth Ease Podcast. Join your host, Michelle Smith, and her guests as they cut through the noise and fear by sharing valuable tips, tools, and proven methods that help you connect with your own inner wisdom as you navigate the sacred journey that is pregnancy, birth, and parenthood in a more relaxed and confident manner. This podcast does not constitute, nor is it intended, as medical advice. Hello, Birthies families. Welcome to this heartfelt space. I'm your host, Michelle Smith, and I'm so grateful you are here. In this two-part conversation, I am thrilled to have one of the pioneers in the field of childbirth education, Barbara Decker. Barbara has been a childbirth educator for almost 50 years. She trained as a Lamaze instructor before it was even called Lamaze International. ASPO, anyone? Anybody else remember that? She's a hypnobirthing practitioner, doula, and an avid supporter of APA, the Association of Pre- and Perinatal Psychology and Health, which is a public benefit, educational, and scientific organization offering information, inspiration, and support to medical professionals, expecting parents, and all persons interested in expanding the horizons of birth psychology. Barbara is one of the mentors for APA's PPNE program, which is the prenatal and perinatal educator certification program. And she is also a certified prenatal bonding facilitator, one of the few in the United States. What brought Barbara to the field of prenatal and perinatal psychology was the knowledge she received after reading The Secret Life of the Unborn Child by Thomas Verney. Since that time, Barbara has received certificates as a prenatal bonding facilitator with BOND, the greatest pregnancy ever program, and she trained for two and a half years with Dr. Gerhard Schroth in the prenatal bonding program. Barbara was one of the first graduates of the APA PPEN program. Her passion for educating parents on the importance of the preconception gestational period led her to write a new paradigm in childbirth education, which she calls Empowering Pregnancy. Barbara has lectured throughout the United States, in India, and in Mexico on the need to teach these classes. It is imperative that we educate our birthing families on the intelligence of the baby growing in the womb. Our babies need to feel love during the pregnancy, Mothers need to manage their stressors in a safe way, and this program offers the tools to build a healthy relationship for the whole family. Parents that have attended the program feel that they are better prepared for their pregnancy, more bonded and attuned to the baby inside, plan for more natural births, an improved relationship with their partners, and feel more prepared for the postpartum experience. When you parent a baby in the womb, you know how to parent when the baby arrives. Attachment improves with a more conscious awareness of the needs of our babies for healthy minds and bodies. Pregnancy complications are lessened, and parents make more informed choices in birthing facilities, care providers, and interventions. It's time to empower our families with the knowledge that emotional intelligence is formed from conception through the nine months after birth. As Thomas Verney says, let's put the brakes on the violence in this country and build babies, not gels. And it just seems more imperative than ever. And so in this first half of our conversation, Barbara shares her almost half century journey as a birth professional, the importance of prenatal bonding and shares a short breathing exercise for families to use. Welcome, Barbara, to the Birthies podcast. I am just beyond thrilled to have you here with me today. Thank you, Michelle, for having me. I'm quite honored to be on your program because I'm quite passionate about the work that I do. Yes, and you have been up to some pretty amazing work in your life. So can you share 
with the audience, with the listeners, what brought you to this work and working with families and babies? I became involved after I had my second son. My first son is about 51, almost 52 years now. And there were very few instructors in the United States at that point that were doing any childbirth education. It was the beginning of the Lamaze technique. And I had bought the book called Thank You, Dr. Lamaze. And I took it to my doctor and I said, I'd really like to do this Lamaze technique. And he said, oh, honey, He said, it's your first baby. It's really too hard. We'll take very good care of you when you come in the hospital. Mm. And this was actually in Florida, Michelle. Oh, wow. (laughs) Santa Rosa County. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And so I trusted my doctor. And when I went into labor and went to the hospital, I was in pretty active labor and I was quite uncomfortable. And every time I had a contraction, I would tense up and sit up in the bed and kind of suffer through the surge. And finally, I decided that I was going to have some pain medication. And what they gave me, I had a very bad reaction to. And it's no longer on the market. So nobody has to worry about having that medication anymore. And so the labor itself and the birth was not pretty. And I saw my son for the first time about 11 hours after I woke back up again. Wow. So they told me that I was allergic to the medication. And when I was having my second child, they said, whenever you have another baby, definitely don't have anything, not even for your stitches. Wow. (laughs) So (laughs) that was kind of a scare. Especially because they cut episiotomies back then. Oh, yeah, you're darn right. They were episiotomies. And, and so you would need a repair. And he's kind of saying that, you know, you can't have anything even for that. Right. So they also said not to have any Novocaine when I went to the dentist office. Mm. So not being a very good dental patient, I didn't go for like three years before my son was born. Mm. And so it was a challenge for me. Anyway, we were with the military and we were stationed in Virginia and they had a program at that point, which was called ASPO, Psychoprophylactics in Obstetrics. Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was the original Lamaze. Yeah. So I used those techniques and I practiced diligently and I was not afraid of my birth at all. I was not afraid of any challenges because I knew the breathing and the focusing was going to work. And when I had my second child, it made all the difference in the world. I was on my way down to the delivery room with my fingers crossed. I hope it's a girl. I hope it's a girl. Mm. And it was a boy, but I kept him anyway. And (laughs) it was uh, back then we didn't have ultrasounds. Right. I didn't with my first. So I didn't know what was happening. You know, my poor son must have been thinking I wanted a girl all the time when he was a boy. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he was this big, rolling baby, chunky baby, and I was blessed. So when I got home from the hospital, I called my instructor and I said, What a difference having some tools to hang on to some breathing techniques, some focusing, some relaxation. It made all the difference in my birthing experience, and I need to be a teacher. So the Naval Hospital actually had a number of mothers that wanted to start teaching. So they set up a program for us. Wow. And then they would send out the different Navy families because it's a very large area, Virginia Beach. And Virginia Beach, Newport News, and so forth. There's tons of military around there. So they would send the families to our home and we would teach the classes for the hospital. Wow. What a wonderful experience that was. And we were stationed overseas. We were transferred over to Italy. And I set up the program at the Naval Hospital in Italy. And we were there for three and a half years. Then when we came back to the States, I taught for a number of years at my local hospital. And I came across an ad from a woman by the name of Penny Simpkin, Mm -hmm. (laughs) who is the, she's the guru of doulas. Right. Well, 
I was one of her first students in New England, and she was doing a training program for what they now call doulas. So I came back from that training program just walking on water. And my husband said, what is the matter with you? I said, because now I have an excuse to go in with my parents mm. after I've taught them their childbirth classes. Now I have a reason to go in with them and assist them in labor. And I had been doing that for years for the naval mothers because oftentimes their husbands would be at sea. Yeah, I had a question about that real quick. When you gave birth with your first child, were you able to have your husband there with you or did you have to give birth alone? Uh, no, he was actually in there with me, but they chased him out when I had all my emergency procedures. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But he was yeah. with me. Yeah. And okay. he was with me the second time also. Okay. Okay. Because Well, that was in 68. You've got to raise okay. 68 because they started husband close childbirth in the 60s. Okay. Well, I was born in 66 and my dad wasn't allowed in. Oh. And so I was wondering if you gave birth by yourself or if your husband was there. Yep. They were allowed in. Wow. That's good. That's good. Yep. So continue. Yes. Yeah, she became a doula. Well, during COVID is about the only time they're not allowed in. Mm -hmm. The military hospitals and all hospitals have been very progressive over the years, realizing that the partner can be an active an active assistant to them. But it's also hard for the partners if they feel like, I'm not going to be able to remember all of this information I'm learning in childbirth class. Right. So the doula is a tremendous asset to anybody that's having a baby. And now, ever since 2014, OBGYN guidelines encourage doulas to be part of the hospital program. Did you know that? I was just thinking that is good to hear. Oh, yes. Because sometimes you hear, I, I was speaking to a physician the other day who was saying she hasn't had good experiences with doulas. Oh, yes. And so that's interesting to hear. That's good. That's good information to have. The guidance said that all the studies prove, study after study, Cochrane study, 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 that the doulas can improve the birth experience, shorten the labors. The mother has better memories about the birth. She feels emotionally supported, lower cesarean rates, lower intervention rates, because we're bringing in the emotional mm -hmm. support. And that's what Penny was trying to do. When we started doing births in the hospital back in the 1920s, thanks to Dr. Joseph DeLee, mm -hmm. he was the one that started everything going downhill and having, making all the births come into the hospitals. That was the beginning of the downfall. But the medical community took over and we weren't giving mothers emotional support. Right. And that's what Penny thought was well, these women need some emotional support to help them through the birth. Women have assisted women for centuries, centuries, right. and we're meant to be together and supportive. So the guidelines came out and they really do encourage that the doulas be part of the birth experience. Now, being a doula is extremely important to go in with the right attitude. If you're going in to a birth and you think you know more than the medical staff and you have a chip on your shoulder, right. you're not going to be part of the team, right? Right. I always say, ideally, everyone that's caring for that family needs to check their ego at the door. Absolutely right. And that goes for the practitioner, mm -hmm. that goes for the nurses, that goes for the doula. Yes. We are there to support that mother. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important. So to be part of the team means that you need to work together. And there are experiences that some of the nurses have had where the doula may be certified or not be certified but have overstepped their bounds as far as the protection of the mother. And it's very important that you work together as a team to give this mother the best outcome possible. And that's what's really important in our childbirth classes also when we're teaching, is that we 
want to empower our parents by using the acronym BRAINS. Mm -hmm. If they have a birth, I don't believe in birth plans, by the way. I believe in birth preferences. With birth plans, plans have a tendency to be changed. No matter when we make plans, there's often something that comes in as an adjunct and you're going to have to switch things around. If that parent is intent on that birth plan, it's going to be a disappointment to her if everything doesn't go the way she wanted. So it's important to take the birth preferences. This is my ideal birth. Mm -hmm. Will you help me achieve this birth? And if we need to make any changes in my preferences, just tell me and help me understand why we have to make the change. When the mother is included in the decision-making, the end result is not traumatization after the birth. It can prevent having an effect on the mother as long as she's part of that decision-making. I absolutely agree. Yeah. So it's an important thing to remember, and that's why we use the anacronym brains. What are the benefits? What are the risks? What does my intuition tell me? Is there an alternative? Can we do nothing? Is it safe? And can we have space to accept the fact that we have to make a change? And at least here in the Seattle area where I live, any of the practitioners include that mother in any decision that's being made. There's a tremendous respect and what the mother needs during that birth. And it really is happening out here in the Seattle area. Now, I can't say that it's happening in other places, but usually in midwifery care, especially midwifery care, the mother, she needs to be included in these decisions and is listened to. It's vital. It's vital. And then our mothers are not going to have the challenges. We don't want our mothers going to the birth, to the labor room, in fear that they're going to have to do battle. Exactly. We want them to know that they're going to be treated with respect. And like I say, that's why I prefer the birth preferences. Because when you do your birth preferences, it's not antagonistic. Right. This is what I'd really love and hope can happen. And will you help me, support me in achieving this? And if we have to make any changes, just explain it to me and so that I understand. Right, right. I like to suggest to my families that they write their birth preferences from the perspective of the baby. Oh. Because you can say it in such a friendly way that's not going to put someone on the defensive. And as you and I know... The perspective of the baby can get forgotten in the birth process, and it's so important to consider what the baby's experiencing. Well, it's interesting you say that, Michelle, because oftentimes in a birth, the baby isn't even considered. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so passionate about APA and the work that APA does, is that the baby is the forgotten person mm -hmm. in that birthing room. Yep. And for you to come with the approach that how is this going to affect my baby? And that's part of the decision making. And that's a really tremendous point for the parents to think about mm -hmm. and the practitioners. Yeah. Now that was that's a beautiful thought. And you don't see that happening often. People think that babies are just a passenger. And it's not, it's not necessarily true. A baby is an active participant in the labor. And the more the mother is in tune with the baby's needs, then she's able to move around, work with her hips, shift from one side to the other side, and be an active participant in the birth, as well as what the baby is telling them to do. So talking to the baby sensing what the baby's needs are, positions that are helping the baby. Those are all super important thoughts when we're birthing our babies. And it should be an important part of any birthing scene. Yeah. Yeah. 
I agree. So you went on to teach hypnobirthing, correct? That is because I was involved at a doula conference. It was back in Toronto, Canada. Phyllis Klaus Mm -hmm. is a psychotherapist, and she's one of the originators of the doula program, DONA. And Phyllis gave two lectures on hypnosis for birthing. Mm. And I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. So I took both of the programs, and I was kind of weepy the rest of the weekend because I was so impressed with the power of hypnosis. Yes, yes. She just took us on a short trip in our minds and made some suggestions of things that might be present, including all of our senses. And I immediately went to my godmother's house. I could smell what was cooking. I could see everything in the house. I just went on this journey in this hour lecture. And at the end of the lecture, I had tears in my eyes because I hadn't thought about this person in many, many years. And yet I felt as though I was in the room, in the house with her. And I thought, wow, this is really powerful work. And I was definitely hooked from then on. So I found out about hypnobirthing. And I trained at the first program that I was able to, and that was in 2000. I met Phyllis in 99, and in 2000, I started training as a hypnobirthing practitioner. Wow. And I could see, I could see the difference that it made in the births. Yeah. With hypnobirthing, our mothers don't get as tired. They're more relaxed. They're not working in their conscious mind. They're working in a more relaxed state so that the baby can do the work and let the baby and the body do the work. And I noticed a difference in the way the mothers weren't so exhausted. They had rewarding births. They felt much more confident when they went in for their birthing circumstances. The thing to remember is any childbirth class, you need to practice the techniques. You just can't accept when you go to class that it's going to work for you. You have to put in the time to learn to trust the techniques. And when you do that, the chances of coming out of that birth time are going to increase tremendously. Plus, with hypnobirthing, we don't promise that every labor is going to go smoothly. Sometimes you have to have a change in your labor. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the calmness will help in the outcome at our what way the labor turns. And we know that with the World Health Organization, 10 to 15% of people are going to need some extra help. So we have to prepare our parents. You might be in that 10 or 15%, or you could be in the 85% that if your practitioner just sat there and knitted, the baby would come out just fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We need to prepare them for unusual circumstances. But in hypnobirthing, we only take one half of one class talking about interventions. The rest of the time we are spending using tools that are going to help them be more relaxed during their labors. So once I became a hypnobirthing practitioner, then Mickey Mongan likes you to also become a hypnotherapist along the way. So I did end up getting my hypnotherapy degree because I wanted to be able to write scripts, individual scripts for my families if they needed something special in their birthing sequence. And in doing the hypnotherapy and the hypnobirthing, we are required to read two books a year and recertify every year. So one of the books that I picked up was The Secret Life of the Unborn Child. Mm Mm-hmm by Thomas Fernie. Mm-hmm. And when I read that book, I really got mad, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, I get mad because I'd been teaching childbirth until I got into hypnobirthing. I had been teaching childbirth and nobody mentioned the concept of how important it was to bond with the baby in the womb. Yeah, you're right. And how the baby is influenced. And in hypnobirthing, we do connect mom and baby in the womb. Yeah. So that was my eye-opening experience. And I've been involved with APA since like 2008 or 2009. And 
I'm just amazed how we have missed the importance of the early nurture period, which is preconception and welcoming the baby, and then having this wonderful, joyous feeling of growing this miraculous baby in our womb, and how pregnancy can be an incredibly empowering state, and be a loving state, rather than aches and pains and medical procedures and fears. It just opened a whole new door for me. So... I took my first training with the greatest pregnancy ever. That was in 2011. It got certified in prenatal with their program, but that's no longer active. My second training was doing the PPNE program through APA. And then my third training was the opportunity to train with a German psychiatrist for two and a half years Mm. in the field of prenatal bonding. That was the highlight. (laughs) The concept behind that, it was interesting. When I met Dr. Schroth, you had to pay to have an interview with him. Wow. If you imagine, you had to pay to see if you would be accepted into the program. And my circumstances were very unusual. My husband was dying at the time. He was in the hospital. And here I had paid all this money to go meet this man and find out about prenatal bonding. And I was only there for half a day before I got called back to the hospital. Mm. But it was interesting because he was doing case studies about women that had taken prenatal bonding and the outcomes. And I was kind of a nuisance in the class because the woman had had a lot of interventions during her pregnancy. And I was questioning, well, why did she have this? And why did she have that? And was this really necessary? And so forth. And I thought he'd get a little upset with me, but it just didn't, you know, from my knowledge of as being a doula and being in the birth world for so long, Mm -hmm. I wasn't afraid to ask questions. Well, anyway, (laughs) I had decided I wasn't going to take the program because it was kind of expensive and it takes two and a half years to do the program. And he called me from Germany and he said, Barb, I need you in this program. (laughs) We need someone with medical background (laughs) because he's a psychoanalyst, but he's also a psychiatrist and he went through medical school. And he said, this program was written for a doula, a childbirth educator, a parent with great interest, anybody in psychology. It was written as a basic program for anyone that wanted to help parents connect with the baby in the womb and to have these wonderful outcomes of falling in love with the baby in the womb and the rest of it follows these usually a very successful birth. It's like the mother and the baby have ESP after the baby's born and the baby sleep better. The parents are connected So they've actually parented the baby within the womb Mm -hmm. so that when the baby's born, it's like, I know exactly what to do. Nobody has to, I don't have to take a parenting course. I know how to take care of my baby. Yeah. And, uh, oh, what a wonderful experience. I have thanked him over and over Mm -hmm. and over. I finished the program in 2013 and I have thanked him over and over and over again for the opportunity to have taken that training program as a childbirth educator, as a doula. And while I was going through my training, his wife was so impressed with what an asset a doula could be during birth. She decided she was going to be a doula too. Wow. (laughs) So I've never regretted it. And it has given me the ability to work with families of all sorts all around the world. I've had families from England, from Egypt, from Sweden that have worked with this program. And I do it on the internet if they're not around in the Seattle area. And had some wonderful, unusual cases. Dr. Schroth has just been so appreciative so appreciative because I will take emergency cases Mm. at the last minute because I know anything that I'm going to do is going to help that mother to help that family. Right. So I'm not afraid to take people at the last minute 
and it can still give them this wonderful shift to fall in love with that baby. It's just the most incredible, rewarding work I've ever done. And I've been doing it for the past seven years. It's my passion now. Wow. And you were able to do that training while your husband was ill? Um, he had passed away by the time oh, the training started. Because okay. you have to go for five days at a time to a location to do the training three to four times a year okay. over a period of two years, two and a half years. Wow. And you have to write up your cases and because you have to take a family through the prenatal bonding, the whole program. And then okay. we do a month evaluation and then a six month evaluation. And you had to finish two cases before you were able to get your certification. So that's why it takes so long. Wow. Yeah. wow. Right. My hat's off to you doing that while you're grieving. And I can see how though it could give fullness to your heart because you're so passionate about it. But that's really remarkable. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that. Well, why don't we take a moment just to take a breather? <laughs> mm. I mm. feel so honored to be in this field. And I'd love to encourage all of the families that you have listening to realize how important our nervous system is in helping us cope with circumstances going on mm -hmm. in the world right now. Yes. And so I really encourage people to take a breather by inhaling through their nose very, very, very slowly, imagining their belly rising, bringing lots of oxygen into our core. And on your exhale, exhaling through your nose, releasing all tension in your body. This is basic meditation breathing. So again, do another breath in through your nose. Expand that abdomen. And then release the air from your nose, releasing all tension in your body. Go ahead at your own speed. Take another breath. Again in the nose and out the nose. And notice how you feel after that third breath. We all need pauses. We all have our own stressors. Many of them intergenerational which is news to many people. But learning to breathe this way connects you to your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your calming part of the autonomic nervous system. If we all took time to do that a couple of times a day, it would help to have our nervous systems more settled a majority of the time. But it's especially important for a mother that's carrying a baby. In this stressful era, parents are faced with challenges of possible medical problems, financial problems, racial problems, intergenerational stress that is carried without us even recognizing it, the stress hormones that are going through our system are actually passing through to our babies. This is forming the nervous system and the brain structure 
of those babies growing in the womb. This is not meant to put weight or one more thing that our families need to think about. It is empowering our families to take the time for themselves as well as their babies. When you do this parasympathetic type breathing and you start thinking about the miracle that you are performing growing this baby and how much you look forward to having this baby in your arms, your hormones are going to switch from stress hormones to love hormones. That's going to teach your baby that there are stressful times and there are calm times. And this, this simple little exercise a few times a day can make all the difference in the emotional intelligence of this baby that you are growing in the womb. This simple exercise so the babies can feel the oxytocin part of the time and they can handle the stress hormones part of the time, because that's the reality of life. We can empower parents to make this change during the pregnancy, teach them this very simple technique, and it can make all the difference in the outcome of that baby's emotional system, their emotional regulation. How does your body feel right now, Michelle? Because I have been a hypnobirthing practitioner since 2002 <laughs> and a hypnotherapist, I really just want to go very deeply within into that state because you just have that presence. So I loved everything you said. It was just beautiful. And it's so true. We know it, Michelle. Mm -hmm. We know it because we see it happen with our families that we work with. Mm -hmm. Being able to just take that time. It was actually a doctor by the name of Fred Worth he worked with a lot of babies. He was either a perinatologist or a neonatologist that wrote the book Prenatal Parenting. Mm. And Fred, he was tired of having to have to stick needles in these little preemie babies because they were born too soon. And he thought there must be something that we can do to prevent preterm labor. So he wrote his own program. Yeah called Prenatal Parenting. His book came out, I think, in 2001. And I remember meeting Fred and wow. buying a book. And I was so impressed with his program. And he did have a chance to train. He wrote this program with his parents that had, had preterm labors. And he wanted to try to prevent it with the future children that they were carrying. And when he used his program, he was able to cut down a tremendous percentage of preterm births because the parents were able to get in touch with their previous stressful histories to learn to do fetal love breaks with their babies three times a day, about 15 minutes. And he was able to cut down the number of preterm babies just using that with his own practice. That is so significant. And I love the term, fetal love breaks. That's amazing. 
apparently Fred died of cancer, mm. but people that knew him said that he basically died of heartbreak because no one would pay attention to his program. Oh. And so Fred was ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And this is the kind of work that we need to do now. And I see it happening right there in Florida. You have a midwife by the name of Jenny Joseph. Yes, she, I used to work for her. Oh, did you really? Yep. Oh, yep. you. Well, Jenny's a dear friend of mine. And uh, I went down to her office to do some work about AFA and uh, to work with their staff to teach them about fetal imprints. It was just wonderful because I had so much respect for Jenny once I heard about the program that she developed. She takes anyone off the street with no insurance, gives them prenatal care, and, you know, who in the world does that? And actually, she came out here to Seattle. That's right. That's the first time that I met her, and then I followed her ever since. Mm -hmm. But Jenny Joseph has the statistics with women that win poverty and at risk from racial violence and poverty. And she has brought those mothers. Her statistics prove that she can empower those mothers because she goes into the prenatal bonding concept. She empowers her mother to make those mothers realize what miracles they are performing forming and growing these babies. And she's having full-term healthy birth weight babies just because she and her staff take care of the mothers in a respectful, empowering way. Yep, her JJ way. And I can hear her in my head <laughs> as she were talking. She's like, we grow fat, healthy babies here. That's what we do. That's her, I was her birth center manager for a while and birth assistant. And I also taught, she had me teach relaxation oh. to her clients. Yes. And what a wonderful opportunity, Michelle. Yeah, it was. I envy you. <laughs> it, it, it was amazing. It's how my birth ease method started so many years ago. She, she's just remarkable. And I remember it was rare for us to have a baby under seven pounds. Most of our babies were eight, nine pounds, healthy, healthy babies. And she said, we don't have scrawny babies. We don't grow scrawny babies here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So she's just a remarkable, remarkable woman. Well, she set up the program so that women could be empowered to realize what a miracle it was that they were growing a baby. She made them feel respected. And I remember her saying that my office staff is there to respect every person that walks through that door. Yes, ma'am. And this is the sort of attitude that we need to take. She's the, as far as she's, she's concerned, I think she has the key to save the lives of babies all over the United States and anywhere else that she goes. Mm -hmm. I have encouraged every organization to have her as a speaker because she has the key to helping healthy families come into the world and help poverty, help racist situations come because everyone is a human being. They have a right to good prenatal care. Yes and that we can all grow healthy babies by being respected and cared for in a respectful way. Yes, and, and forming a relationship. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And relationships are critical. Please join us for the second half of our conversation in the next episode. Barbara will share more fully about this fascinating field of pre and perinatal psychology and what continues to drive her to keep learning and sharing about the positive and life-changing aspects of prenatal bonding and pre- and perinatal psychology. And if you are enjoying the show, please share it with a friend, and you can rate, review, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, because that helps to get this valuable information to more families. So thank you again for listening.
For more great conversations like these, or to find out more information and access Michelle's library of amazing guests, go to birthdeeservices.com forward slash podcast. For more information on the Birthdees Method, Michelle's classes, meditations, and other services, go to birthdeeservices.com.